Birth of a Nation is widely considered one of the most important films in cinema history. Artistically, it's viewed as a landmark in filmmaking, both in technique and scale. Its director, D.W. Griffith, is considered a pioneer in filmmaking and editing, and this is best demonstrated by the sheer scale of the film. At around 3 hours and 13 minutes long, it was the longest film that had ever been released when it originally debuted in 1915. Birth of a Nation had a budget of $110,000. Adjusted for inflation, that's just shy of $3.2 million. Adjusting its domestic box office earnings for inflation, it made, at the very least, $170 million. The exact numbers are disputed, but the message remains. The film was, and still is, an extraordinary success. Its artistic legacy is one of innovation, a foundational work for the modern film industry, and big budget film productions as we know them today. Its cultural legacy, however, is something entirely different. You might be wondering what such a groundbreaking, technical masterpiece of a movie was actually in service of. And, well... One of the most vile and unapologetically racist films ever put to screen. Problematic does not begin to describe this. A monumental piece of blatantly racist propaganda. Yeah, so there's a tiny detail I've neglected to mention until now that this film, widely regarded as one of the most important of all time, is an origin story for the Ku Klux Klan, formed in response to the newly freed slaves running amok and going after innocent white women. The movie's words, not mine. Now with this key detail uncovered, an uncomfortable question arises. How do we actually talk about this movie? The easy thing to do, in this case, would be to reject the film outright. It's a racist film, made over a hundred years ago, that peddles a racist ideology with no backing in reality. Best to just sweep it under the rug and wash our hands of it, right? The problem with that is that you blind yourself to the ways in which this film expresses that historical racism and how it communicates its ideology. This movie, shot in 1915, expresses fears of black people committing voter fraud by stuffing ballot boxes in order to get their way. The movie's ending, intended to uplift the audience after the final confrontation, depicts KKK members intimidating black citizens away from voting as a triumph, a victory. Kyle Colgren spoke about this exact thing in his video which I highly recommend watching. The parallels to contemporary politics are numerous, the film acts as a time capsule but one that's been left open in plain sight for decades. When you pay attention to it, you realise how little these fears have changed. Colgren believes that this is the way you should consume Birth of a Nation, not for its technical feats which he argues weren't all that innovative, but rather for the messages and fears these technical elements express. He argues that since there are numerous films that display these same technical feats far earlier than Birth of a Nation did, that we should examine and praise those instead. And while this perspective is important, I fear it too is rather limiting in how we talk about this film. Colgren's approach is limited in perspective because it advocates the dismissal of this film based on it being propaganda, which, make no mistake, it most certainly is. My issue, however, lies in simply accepting that this film is propaganda without acknowledging why or how it serves this purpose. I fear that if we don't examine the actual content of this film and how it serves to legitimise itself in its cause, then we'll blind ourselves to the actual methods that made this film such an effective, harmful tool. I'm gonna have to do a lot of engaging with this film on its own terms in order to highlight and analyse how it delivers the messages it does. This is not an endorsement of the film, I find its messaging repugnant, but the message is still there, and I have to be able to explain how, on an artistic level, this film delivers that message. It isn't enough to simply dismiss the film and its content based on how innovative it was, because while that is an important aspect of how this film seeks to manufacture its own legacy, there's still so much more to it than that which I wanted to delve into today. After all, there's a reason this film reinvigorated the Ku Klux Klan to the extent that it did, and that's because, even if it didn't invent these techniques, it used them extremely effectively to spread its message of hate. So let's take a look at that. 
Two hours and 12 minutes into the film, protagonist Ben Cameron's sister, Flora, is assailed by Gus, a freed slave. These characters aren't so much characters as they are tools, simplistic narrative devices designed to convey an idea or ideology. In this case, the fear of miscegenation, marriage and reproduction between different ethnic groups. It's important to understand that this scene directly follows one in which black congressmen pass a vote to allow said interracial marriage, complete with them acting unruly, leering at the white women they're now allowed to marry, and eating fried chicken. And let's talk about the editing of these scenes before we delve into the narrative, because regardless of how much these films actually innovated, they do a hell of a lot to convey their ideology. The intercutting of leering black congressmen with the white women observing them. This is called a montage, not like Rocky running in the snow and beating up a tree, but the actual cinematic application of this term which refers to a sequence of shots and the meaning produced by their interplay. So in Rocky, these shots in quick succession indicate the frequency of his training, the passage of time, and the repeated nature of his intense practice. In Birth of a Nation, yeah. Montages can be used to juxtapose images as much as they can be to connect them. Again, in a purely functional sense, it gives different angles to an event. On a deeper level, it creates a contrast. Editing is often referred to as the invisible art, because it has to be invisible in order for the film to stay effective. If the editing is too jarring, it can break immersion, not seem real. Every shot is ordered the way it is for a reason, imbued with a message. So when it comes to a movie like this that wants so desperately to create a contrast between races, to sow division and justify hate, it's incredibly important to understand how this film, through the invisible art of its editing, accomplishes those goals. After Congress has allowed the intermarriage of races, we cut back to the Cameron family. Their youngest daughter, Flora, ventures into the woods to frolic. It's at this point that Gus, emboldened by the congressional changes we just observed, stalks her to ask for her hand in marriage. We're treated to another montage, again creating distinctions between these characters and what they represent. Gus lingers in the shadows, intently focused on her like a predator. Flora, meanwhile, remains in the light, oblivious to the danger she's in. These two concepts, light versus dark, and their resulting associations are repeatedly contrasted with one another, further sowing division between these two sides, innocence versus depravity, light versus shadow, and of course, white versus black. These are the contrasts being made by the film's moment to moment and greater structural editing. This scene employs another form of montage called the Kuleshov effect. To put it simply, this is a phenomenon where a character's face means different things depending on the shots it's intercut with. A neutral expression can mean hunger, grief, or lust depending on the shots it's edited with. So keeping that in mind, we can now see how the shots of Gus's gaze interact with the shots of Flora. Again, in a general sense, it's just a way of showing that he's watching her, but in a cinematic sense, the preconceptions of the audience attribute intent to his expression. This is why the greater narrative structure of the film is so important in this regard. We've just seen interracial marriage being allowed. Now, the gaze of a black man is paired with a white woman. The previous scene influences the perception of what he's thinking, his intent. It's no longer the gaze of a black man upon a white woman, but the predatory gaze of a black man upon an innocent white woman. This is the result of this film invisibly swaying the perception of these characters at every possible moment. Gus chases Flora through the forest, while her brother, Ben, tries to track them down and intervene. The chase eventually leads Flora to the edge of a cliff, where she threatens to jump to her death unless Gus relents. He refuses, so she does. Flora's death scene is where the film's thesis, justifying not only the existence, but necessity of the Ku Klux Klan, really becomes apparent. Her death is a reflection of that of the South, a devastating loss of life and innocence which, in the eyes of those who supported them, came at the hands of a cruel and barbarous North. And this justification of the South and their victimhood immediately continues when Ben goes to hold Flora's body. The shot references the Pieta, the statue of the Virgin Mary holding the body of Christ after his death. In case you didn't get that reference, don't worry, the film immediately reinforces it with one of its intertitles referring to the pearly gates, found in an honourable death. This is just the start of a heavy bombardment of religious imagery and references. Jumping forward a little to where Gus is caught and the clan's cause is finally legitimised, we again see the religiosity of the clan as depicted in this film. 
The scene is titled The Trial. The clan is depicted in white robes, crosses emblazoned across the chest. As Gus is held, the scene cuts between this lynching and Flora's corpse. Cause and effect here are repeatedly hammered home as we understand, thanks to this montage, that Gus did this. He killed Flora and is dying due to his own actions. The final intertitle of this scene simply reads, Guilty before he's dragged off and lynched. Look at how the characters are framed in this scene, organized in the way you'd see in a ritual, even the costumes which at the time weren't actually the uniform of the KKK who preferred to be discreet, wanting no identifiable markers for when they could attack innocent black people and then retreat. But here, the white robes, the crosses, all of it plays into the idea of a ritual, a long established practice justified simply by the fact that it has ties to long standing tradition. The hoods are reminiscent of those of the Nazarenes and by extension the Capiro, a headdress worn by Hispanic Catholics in procession. This is a historically disputed claim with the origin of the clan hood as depicted in this movie contested across literature, but you have to ask, does it really matter? Even if it's as simple as a Hollywood costume designer taking inspiration from pre-existing religious imagery, it still serves to appropriate and recontextualize it through the lens of the clan's ideals. One article I found goes so far as to call this a coincidence, but when it comes to organizations like these seeking to justify themselves with pre-existing frameworks, there's no such thing as coincidences. It all falls under the appearance of religiosity, which ultimately serves to justify the existence of the clan. This is why it's so important that this imagery is combined with words like trial and guilty. It reinforces the image of the clan as something justified throughout history. The appearance of ritual, of religion and holy retribution doesn't need to be based in reality because it's striking enough aesthetically for the connection to be made. As Dan Olson said of Triumph of the Will, they didn't tap into Christian imagery because they shared Christian values, they did it because those images have emotional meaning to the people. It's no different here. Religious iconography, that of sacrifice, holy retribution, and divine justice are all interwoven with the formation, the very essence of the Ku Klux Klan. And this brings me to the lost cause ideology that this film and its embedded meanings ultimately aim to promote. The Lost Cause is an ideology brought to life by many ex-Confederates that sought to lionize the Confederate cause, turning them into martyrs. Instead of the Confederates committing treason by seceding, it instead became a matter of rebelling against a tyrannical government imposing on their freedoms, their state's rights. They didn't simply lose, but boldly sacrifice themselves against an overwhelming, vastly superior force. Naturally, it's all a bunch of Confederate cope, but it served as a means of post hoc justifying the Confederate cause as righteous, just, and with divine favour. It's no longer a contemptuous failure of traitor states, but the South defending and dying for what has always been, and will always be, their freedoms. But how does one legitimise this cause in the face of such devastating failure? Well, now I need to delve into the book series that Birth of a Nation is based on. The film is based on the 1906 book titled The Klansman, which you're probably already aware of if you have so much as a passing knowledge of the film. What's interesting here is that Thomas Dixon, the book's author, inserted his own ancestry into the foundation of this fictionalized clan. Dixon had Scottish heritage and drew on that for the imagery of a burning cross used by the clan to rally their troops. This is a reference to the Scottish clans of old who would do the same in times of war to rally together against a larger threat. Again, on a surface surface level, it just sounds like an author drawing from their own experiences and knowledge for world building, but on a deeper, rhetorical level, it serves an additional purpose. Dixon is drawing a connection between the historical Scottish tribes and the Ku Klux Klan. In choosing proven historical acts to do this, he retroactively applies the legacy of old Scotland to that of the Klan, artificially inserting pre-established tradition into the very foundation of the Klan. Without this parallel, the Klan is just something Ben Cameron can Receives when he sees white children scaring off black children by wearing a white bedsheet in a scene so on the nose it would fit into any modern day biopic. But with this additional thread tying the clan to establish historical practice, it justifies the existence of the clan as the continuation of some long running tradition, the fight against oppression, invaders, and the unity of a country's true people. It's the same for the heavy Christian imagery used in this scene. It is fundamentally a means of providing the confederation 
they're at cause with more legitimacy across history than it's actually deserving of. Artificial tradition, a manufactured legacy that places clan, justice and retribution alongside that of Christianity and the wrath of God himself, interwoven with all Anglo-Saxon history. This film, as well as providing narrative justification for the existence of the clan, also says something more with the choices it makes. It isn't just an origin story of the Ku Klux Klan, but a manifesto on why the clan has always been justified and will always be justified, and this is by design. The bombardment of religious imagery, aesthetics and traditions is intentional, and it worked. This film, and by extension the ideology embedded within it, were a huge success. Its international release, delayed by the First World War, brought even more attention to the film and sympathy to its Lost Cause ideology. Across the country, a resurgence of the clan. They paraded in the streets, dressed in the white robes depicted in the movie. A cosplay that evolved into a uniform. A uniform that evolved into an identity, that of the in-group opposed to everyone else. A uniform that united, justified and linked a racist ideology which, thanks to this film, was now canonised by religious imagery. And there were other aspects of this film, not within the work itself but surrounding it, which further served to legitimise it and manufacture a legacy of its ideals. One such example I've not seen discussed too often is an event which occurred at one of the film's first screenings, during the chase scene with Flora and Gus. The myth goes that during the chase scene, audiences were so impacted by what they saw that one viewer stood up, took out his gun and began shooting at the screen in an effort to save Flora. Now, did this actually happen? Well, probably not, but the myth's existence serves an important purpose. This story rings strikingly similar to that of audience reactions to one of the first motion pictures ever premiered, Arrival of a Train, where they were said to be so terrified of the image of a train barreling towards them that they up and fled the theatre for fear of the train crashing through the screen into the crowd spectating. Now again, this probably didn't happen, but it serves as kind of a founding myth of cinema, a testament to film realism and the impact it can have on an audience. In tying Birth of a Nation to this founding myth, the film further manufactures a legacy, a sense of this film's belonging within film canon. It places itself among the very foundations of cinema as though it's always belonged there. It embeds itself within history and further serves to manufacture its own legacy and legitimacy in history. It's the same for the book series this film was based on. Its author, Thomas Dixon, initially wrote these novels heroising the clan as a response to Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous pro-abolition novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Dixon was so furious at this overly charitable depiction of black people as human beings that he created the first book as a response to it, using the names of Beecher's characters for his own but changing them to suit his own ends. So instead of Uncle Tom, the kindly black man who dies protecting slaves from white plantation owners, he becomes Tom Camp, a white confederate war veteran whose family suffers at the hands of emancipated slaves. This is the kind of historical reworking inherent to not only this film but its source material. This novel was created to leech off the pre-established characters of Beecher Beecher's novel and manufacture a discourse, shaping it as a response to another popular work when in reality it's little more than racist fanfiction. But again, it serves the purpose of legitimising the legacy of this work and the skewed version of history it presents as on par, deserving of the same consideration as the real history it seeks to bastardise and misrepresent. Colgren speaks extensively of the mythology surrounding this film's innovation, that it was a foundational work for Hollywood as we know it today. He takes great care to dismantle the notion that Birth of a Nation was the first of its kind. He does a very good job at highlighting the press, the hype, that this movie was subjected to which no doubt further served to legitimise it. But again, as I hope I've been able to outline, none of that matters so long as the film itself is still able to convey its ideology. The press and promotion of this film is important to dismiss, but it's also important to understand that this film legitimises itself and its ideology without those extra details. I was originally going to make this a more general video, talking about the ways cinematic propaganda can be effectively used to persuade. I found Colgren's video through a comment chain under Dan Olson's video on Triumph of the Will. The people in those comments were looking for any reason to be able to disregard Birth of a Nation as a significant film, and cited Colgren's video as a means of doing so. I find this 
highly irresponsible, quite frankly. It's irresponsible to think that in debunking some rumours about this film, that its entire ideology and means of persuasion are defeated. We can't brush off the ways this film does effectively manipulate its viewer because it wasn't the first to do so. A well-told lie might not be original, but that doesn't make it any less dangerous. To suggest otherwise is to underestimate the danger that films like this represent. It doesn't really matter to the meaning of the film in question, does it? If nobody had stood up to shoot at the screen during the chase sequence, if the film had never been screened at the White House, if Woodrow Wilson had never endorsed the film by calling it history written in lightning, would that mean that this film's harmful ideology, its religious legitimization of the Klan, and their hatred of black people wouldn't have mattered? I don't think so. This film was hyped, and that did impact its legacy as we know it today, but we also have to take care not to ignore how art actually conveys its message. If we do that, then we blind ourselves to other works of art that promote equally dangerous ideologies in a less obvious way. So how do we talk about Birth of a Nation? I think it's important to possess the tools to comprehend what media is trying to tell us. Film is a language, constructed and imbued with symbols and meanings that are accepted, standardised. In the same way that this cinematic language can tell stories, paint pictures and elicit emotion, it can also be used to tell a lie. A lie that, if left unchallenged, will remain dangerous regardless of everything else surrounding it. So while I agree with Colgren that this film shouldn't be admired for its technical aspects, I feel that those technical aspects shouldn't be underestimated or dismissed because they aren't original. After all, there must have been a reason this film was so compelling as to revitalise a dying clan before its legacy was established, right? There's a reason this film is used for KKK recruitment propaganda. Right? We have to understand how a lie is built in order to combat it, to understand how messages like these can be so effectively delivered. If we allow ourselves to fear and avoid engaging with media like this on its own terms, and instead seek to lazily disregard it based on only a small fraction of the lies it tells to manufacture its own legacy, then all we really do is blind ourselves to the ways we're lied to, and prevent ourselves from being able to combat the misinformation that propaganda like this spreads. And if we do that, then we've already lost. Thanks very much for watching everyone. This was a topic that's been on my mind for a while and I just wanted to get my opinions out there. I think it's valuable that people like Colgren point out this film's illegitimacy, but I haven't seen anybody outline how this film tries to communicate its message as a standalone entity and I hope I've been able to do that today. I think understanding the way a lie is told is an extremely important tool to have and allows us to better see the patterns for the next time around. But what do you guys think? Is it better to disregard this film based on its false legacy or should we instead engage with it on its own terms, however uncomfortable that may be, in order to better understand the lie it tells. Make sure to let me know in the comments below. As always, check out the donation links in the pinned comment and subscribe if you want to catch the next video. There's also a bonus video going up on my Patreon channel where I similarly discuss a much more recent film from a much more familiar face, so be sure to subscribe if you want to see that and get early access to any other upcoming projects. That's all for this time, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.